And joining us on the line now from Kingston, Ontario, Dr. Meredith Chivers. She is Associate Professor in Psychology at Queen's University. Dr. Chivers, glad to have you on the line from Kingston. How are you tonight? I'm fine. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Not at all. This may be an odd first question, but let's go for it anyway. Why does someone become a sex researcher? That's a good question. Um, I'm fascinated um, by uh, bisexuality, and I have been for, for many years. Um, my interest in, in psychology sort of crystallized into an interest in sexuality when I was an undergraduate student, and, um, and I pursued, gra pursued graduate studies um, in the area. And I, I think first and foremost, I'm a scientist, and the excitement of working in a field like sexuality where there remains so much to be discovered um, has certainly contributed to my interest in the field. If you had to put a ratio on it, how much of your research focuses on women's desires as opposed to men's desires? I'd probably put it at 80% women and 20% men. My research primarily focuses on female sexuality. And why that ratio? Um, when I first started doing my research at uh, Northwestern University as a graduate student, um, I was particularly interested in the question, uh, uh, an area of research that hadn't really been examined with women, which was the relationship between women's sexual interests and their patterns of sexual response in the laboratory. And um, there had been such a wealth of research done with men that this was a pretty glaring oversight. And since then, I've seen uh, similar areas of research that really require a focus on women's sexuality at this point. So fair to say that research into sexuality at this point I guess before you started, has been pretty sexist? Um, I, I would say it's been biased in favor of research on males, but I, I'd say over the past 30 years, um, there's been increasing interest in e exclusively research looking at women's sexuality, in particular in addressing um, questions of treating and understanding women's sexual problems. Well, can you give us, for example, one previously held misconception about women's sexuality that through your research you have helped to debunk? I think one of the, the most um, uh, one of the findings that certainly uh, contradicts uh, uh, common knowledge or thought common, common knowledge about female sexuality um, is that women do not get sexually aroused when they watch explicit um, erotica. Um, this isn't a, a finding that's, that's exclusive to my research, but it's been shown consistently over and over that women do have very strong physical responses to, um, to sexual stimuli. Now with my research, what has been um, uh, also shown is that women's sexuality, which can be conceptualized as being um, uh, less robust, more timid than that of males, women are showing sexual responses to a much broader uh, range of sexual stimuli than men typically show. Um, in particular, women show sexual responses to uh, erotica that do and don't correspond with their stated sexual interests. Uh, why did we have the earlier impression that it was the opposite? Um, I think that the earlier impression was probably formulated from uh, intuition. You know, you'd expect that somebody would uh, show their greatest amounts of physical responding to things that correspond with what they say they like. Um, but I think it was also that that uh, perspective was informed by the research that had been done with men that showed that there was a very strong relationship between the two. And I think that those findings were then extended to women. And, and with the research that I've done, it's shown that that model of uh, sexual interest and sexual response doesn't work for women. Hmm. When you are researching sexuality, how do you separate the innate from that which has been culturally learned? Uh, well, it's a very, very difficult task. Um, certainly one of the, the questions that comes up repeatedly in my research is, you know, are we looking at a sex difference, so something that is biologically related to maleness and femaleness, or are we looking at um, a gender difference, so something to do with the gender roles of being male and female, um, with the former being thought to be more innate and the latter more um, socially constructed. Uh, some of the research that I've done points in the direction of this being um, a sex difference. Uh, so for example, one of the, the studies we conducted at Northwestern University looked at the sexual responses of biological males who were living in the female gender role. So these were uh, transsexual women. And what we were curious to see was whether trans women would show patterns of sexual response in the laboratory that were similar to natal women who were living in the female gender role, or whether their patterns were more similar to those of biological males. And uh, what we found was the latter, that indeed these trans women were showing patterns of sexual response that you would see in natal men, um, which lends some support to the uh, hypothesis that this difference in what I call specificity of sexual arousal may be um, innate.
Hmm. I, I wonder as well if you could help us with the impression again that we have that may not be borne out by research, but you'll let us know, that the sexual orientation of women may be more, not sure what the right word here is, but let's say fluid or flexible sure. than, than that of men. Is that the case? Sure. Uh, well, I think that there's, you know, a, 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 there's quite a, 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 an amount of evidence that's accumulating that shows that um, there is greater flexibility and fluidity in women's sexual identity. Um, certainly the research that I've done shows that um, women's sexual psychophysiology uh, fits with this in that women's sexual responses, their physical responses to stimuli are quite broad, but their self-reported feelings of sexual arousal are more in line with their stated sexual interests. Um, another researcher whose work was discussed in the New York Times Magazine article, Lisa Diamond, has been following um, non-heterosexual women for uh, a long period of time and looking at shifts in their sexual attractions and sexual identity. And again, she's also sort of pioneered this, this investigation of female sexual flexibility with respect to, to sexual orientation. We should just say parenthetically at this point, the New York Times Magazine piece that you're talking about that came out, uh, oh, I guess, a few weeks ago now, mm -hmm. um, I guess a few people read that, eh? A few people did read it. You, you want to give us some numbers? Uh, well, the estimate that I heard was um, that the uh, website received 20 million hits, so they say that about 20 million readers um, did access the article and read it. Um, and it was on the top uh, emailed article for list for, I think, uh, at least a week. But they, the New York Times Magazine has said that they believe that this is the most read New York Times Magazine article in history. So basically, there's no interest in your work out there at all. <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> um, how about this? I mean, presumably part of the interest in, in that piece and in your work stems from the fact that we are still, in the year 2009, some of us anyway, uncomfortable talking about all of this. How do you deal yes. with that when you're trying to do research? Um, well, it, you approach it, uh, I, I think, professionally. Um, sexuality, though, it can be a taboo or a difficult subject for some people. I think if you approach the topic from a, a professional perspective, that you can make it a much um, less difficult experience for the people who are, for example, participating in a research study, to um, colleagues who hear about my research, to the students that I teach, to the general public when I, I discuss my research with the media. Um, and I, I think that it's very important, despite the taboo, despite the, the, the discomfort some people might feel, to um, make an effort to educate people about sexuality um, as much as possible. Let's get into one of those areas right now that I think was very controversial, touched on in that New York Times piece, and that is this notion of arousal versus consent. Yes. We, assume, we assume that if someone is physically aroused, then they are sexually attracted to something. Yes. Is that always the case with women? No. Most definitely not. Um, you know, certainly, ag again, the research I've done shows that women can experience physical sexual responses to stimuli, but these may not correspond with their actual feeling uh, of se being sexually aroused or feeling sexually attracted uh, to a particular person. Now, certainly in the cases of women who have been sexually assaulted, they can experience physical responding during the sexual assault, but this um, does not in any way mesh with their um, emotion in the situation. They're not consenting to the sexual activity. Now, one of the things you're telling us here in one respect is that there, I don't know how to put this colloquially, but, but the body is kind of, the, is it the body is willing but the mind isn't? Something is happening physiologically in the body to, to, to go along with that act that the mind clearly abhors. Yes. What is it that's going on? Well, I think, and other researchers have, um, have thought that this represents um, a protective response by the body. So in a situation where a person is exposed to sexual stimuli, that, that for women um, it may be beneficial for them to have this sort of automatic, um, in some cases unbidden, uh, sexual response that then reduces the likelihood of the person experiencing injury if they are sexually assaulted. How do you think that physical, I presume it's a physiological change that's happened over the years, how do you think that's, that's biologically happened? Well, one potential, you know, one possibility is that it's been through um, an evolutionary process whereby women who didn't have a, an automatic or reflexive um, physical response in a sexual situation uh, may have been injured during the sexual assault through, um, so one of the byproducts of um, sexual arousal for women is vaginal lubrication, and this um, reduces the likelihood of discomfort and harm to the, the vagina and the genitals during um, sexual intercourse. So it's not uncommon for uh, during sexual assaults if a woman isn't 
um, lubricated for her to experience tearing or other injuries. And if you think, you know, several tens of thousands of years ago, such an injury could um, actually become an infection which could ascend the reproductive tract and render women sterile, thereby she would not pass on her genes to the next generation. So this is one possibility um, as to how this adaptive mechanism has been acquired in women. So obviously lubrication or arousal does not equal consent, obviously. No, it does not. Let's follow up on this. Men have Viagra to prepare them for sex if the body, so to speak, no longer cooperates. Is there anything similar out there for women? I, well, there has certainly been um, a wealth of research that's been conducted on the effects of Viagra in women, and um, unlike with men, the results haven't been um, particularly helpful in the cause of treating women's sexual dysfunction. Uh, Viagra does work in women in the sense that it does increase uh, physical sexual responding, um, but it doesn't necessarily translate into women feeling sexually aroused or feeling sexual desire. So um, I have jokingly referred to it as a very expensive lubricant, um, <laughs> not having any effect on women's psychological state of interest in sexuality. There are several drugs that are under development um, that, that are trying to um, capture this market, but to date no one has come up with the, the magic pill for women um, as Viagra has been for men. It does kind of follow up on what we talked about at the top of the interview, though, where there seems to be a great deal of emphasis on finding products and understanding as it relates to men's desires, but not so much for women. Another example here? Um, well, I think that there actually has been quite a bit of um, research that's been invested in, in figuring out um, you know, products and, and treatments for women. Um, I think that the, the research just hasn't been as conclusive. If anything, it's, it's reflecting, I think, um, how poorly we understand the mechanisms of sexual response and sexual desire in women, and certainly calls for a greater amount of research to understand these basic phenomenon before we move forward to try to develop treatments. Am I right uh, that you've done research on both sides of the border? Yes, I have. Okay, have you noticed a, a political or a perception difference uh, from the way your work is regarded in Canada versus the United States? Um, in some respects, yes. Um, I found that the, the, the kind of research I was doing at Northwestern University was made, made some individuals uncomfortable. There were restrictions placed on being able to use students, for example, in, in my research. Um, and ethics review boards would take more note of potentially charged issues relating to uh, my research, whereas when I, I came back to Canada um, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, um, I was quite pleasantly surprised at how easily the research um, ethics proved the work that I was going to do and how little fuss was made of the methodologies I was planning on implementing. Hmm. Any theories as to why that is? Um, I think it may have more to do with the institutions that I was working in. Um, at Northwestern University, I think I was the first researcher to establish a sexual psychophysiology laboratory, so the ethics committee had never seen this kind of work before, so they were uh, very understandably um, going to attend to all of the details, whereas at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, I think they had quite a bit of experience in that area. But I think in general, in, in Canada, there, there seems to feel like there's more of a, an open um, environment to, to speak about sexuality. Okay, let me ask you a couple more things. And first of all, why do you think your research is important to begin with? I think my research is important for uh, just general basic understanding of how women's sexuality and men's sexuality differ um, and to understand the, uh, the female sexual response system. Are there ever days when you think you're taking the romance out of this stuff? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly sitting down behind a computer, taking you know, somebody's arousal responses, cleaning them up, dicing up the data, analyzing it that way. It, it can seem very far removed in some ways from um, the actual act that I'm interested in studying, um, but ultimately I know this scientific process is hopefully going to uh, contribute to knowledge that will ameliorate people's sex lives. Yeah, having said that, though, one wonders if uh, you know February 14th is just another day on the calendar for you. Um, well, my you know my personal life, uh, <laughs> I, my my husband is also a sexuality researcher, so there there's a healthy amount of discussion of work that goes on at home as well. Um, but I, I've learned over the years that it's, it's best to keep a very strong line between the professional and the personal. Understood. Lest I, lest I take the joy out of my own, uh, my own personal <laughs> life. Good for you. Dr. Chivers, it's good of you to join us on the line from Kingston, Ontario. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.